Number 1. Imaginary Gus When I was in my early teens, my family moved from the city out to the country. It was quite the transition, going from a city life to living in a house that was at least a 15 minute drive to the next closest house. My dad, however, had always dreamed of being a farmer, and since we were extremely comfortable financially, he was able to take a chance and pursue that dream. I had one older brother and one younger sister. Being the middle kid, I often had to feel like I was the bridge between the two. My brother was 16 at the time, and even though he was a pretty decent kid for the most part, like most older brothers, he occasionally liked to pick on me, and occasionally my sister as well. But I'll come back to that in a little while. My sister was seven when we moved into the new house. It was a nice brick house, a ranch, with a very large basement. The basement was half finished, meaning that it had cinder block walls, but still it wasn't in any way exposed to the outside. But it didn't have carpeting or sheetrock like the rest of the house. My dad and mom put all of our toys in the basement and it was officially our playroom. Not long after we moved into the house, my sister began acting really strange. She began talking to herself when she was in the basement alone. The first time that it happened, my parents asked her about it later on. She told them that she had made a new friend, Gus, an older man that liked to visit her in the basement. At first my parents were alarmed, thinking that someone had broken into the house, but it didn't take very long for them to determine that Gus was nothing more than a figment of my sister's imagination. Gus became a regular topic of discussion concerning my sister. She would bring up the times that Gus would come and talk to her in the basement. Often, I would hear her talking about Gus, and I would go down to the basement to check and see if there really was anyone down there. Conveniently though, Gus had always left immediately before I came down. While the talking about Gus didn't really bother me, I didn't ever have imaginary friends myself, and although I didn't understand why anyone would, it didn't bother me that people did. My older brother, on the other hand, was always sick and tired of hearing our sister talk about him. Often, he would just get aggravated at our sister and just tell her to stop talking about her dumb and fake friend. About five months after we had moved in, our parents were in town, and my brother was supposed to be watching my sister and me. My brother had this weird and annoying habit that whenever our parents weren't home, he'd sneak into my parents' room, grab my dad's porno tapes, and he would watch them in the living room. He did this because the picture window in the living room faced the long driveway and he would know when my parents were coming home. My sister and I were always forbidden from coming into the living room, not that I would have wanted to at that age anyway. On this day, my sister had been downstairs talking to Gus. I was in the kitchen getting a snack. Unexpectedly, my sister ran up the stairs and into the living room, surprising my brother. He had to quickly turn the TV off. Gus told me you were watching bad movies and that you better stop. My sister yelled at our older brother. Oh, I am so damn sick of hearing about Gus. My angry brother yelled in response. There is no such person. Stop being an idiot. Of course, my sister was upset and my brother had made her cry. I came to her defense and told him that her talking about Gus didn't hurt him in any way. He of course got irritated with me and told me I was encouraging her to act stupid. 
when I continued to defend my sister, my brother finally got irritated at me, and he got up and grabbed me by the arm. Fine, why don't you spend some time down there with him then? He yelled, and began violently pulling me over to the basement door. Now, I spent a lot of time in the basement by myself, so I wasn't scared to go down there. But no one likes to be forced somewhere that they don't want to be. So I struggled, but there was no way I could overpower my brother, who dragged me and shoved me into the basement. Once I was in, he locked the door and yelled at me, Make sure to say hi to Gus for me. I was so pissed off, because I didn't want to be in the basement then. But then, I suddenly remembered that there was an outside door. There was a stairwell on the side of the house that led into the basement, and the door at the bottom could only be locked from the inside. Feeling smart for outwitting my brother, I turned to walk to the stairwell. I stopped, dead in my tracks, when I saw a grown man standing in the window of that door in the stairwell, looking right at me. He held up his hand, waggled his fingers in a little wave, and then left. Now, scared shitless, I ran up the stairs to the inside door that my brother had locked and began slamming on it screaming at my brother to open the door. I was screaming that there was someone in our yard. Finally, I was able to get my brother to open the door and let me out. I told him about the man in the stairwell, and he ran out into the yard to look around. But of course, no one was there. He chalked it up to me just wanting to give him a hard time about being an ass. But when I described the man to my sister... She smiled and said simply, Well, that was Gus. It was freaky. I mean, I don't know who Gus was or if he meant my sister any harm. According to her, she never saw him again. But for months, my sister was playing with an imaginary grown-up friend who was anything but imaginary. Number 2. The Tune in the Attic The only time my family ever moved when I was growing up was shortly after my youngest brother was born. There was already four of us siblings and not nearly enough bedrooms. My parents wanted us all to have our own rooms as we got older. So, they bought a three-story Victorian-style house. Having a three-story house was pretty neat and I actually still own the house today. But definitely, having my own bedroom for the first time ever was the neatest thing of all. There was one bedroom and one study on the top floor of the house, along with the bathroom. Then there was a door that led to a staircase that took you into the attic. It wasn't one of those attics that you could live in, though. You could store things in it, but that was really about it. There was no real ceiling, just pink insulation under the roof. In typical horror movie fashion, though, there were things stored in the attic that the previous owners of the house had left there. Most of it wasn't anything that was of any interest, though. There were boxes of old books, and a ton of boxes full of National Geographic magazines. There was a desk with a vanity mirror on it, and some poles with old clothes hanging from them. I took the bedroom on the top floor simply because I thought it was the neatest room. It had a big outside window with a cushioned couch to sit on. I really liked it. None of my other siblings fought me for it because it was also the smallest bedroom in the house, but I didn't mind. About two weeks after we moved in, I was laying in bed, and I thought that I heard what sounded like music coming from the attic. I mostly dismissed it the first time, because I figured it may have been coming from one of the other bedrooms, 
and I was only confusing it as coming from the attic. This, however, changed when the following night I heard the song again. Although it was really a faint tune, it was definitely coming from the attic. The following day at breakfast, I asked my family if any of them had been up in the attic the night before, or the night before that. They all seemed surprised at the question, and when I told them I heard a small tune being played up there, they all just chalked it up to be in my imagination. Typical, huh? Well, the tune ended up not going away. I heard it again. And again. For the next few nights. It didn't play all night either, just for about ten minutes every night. I honestly believed one of my siblings was messing with me. So eventually, I decided that I would keep an eye on the door one night, and if any of them went up there, I would know that they were messing with me. After going up in the attic one night, just to make sure that no one was in it, I turned my bedroom light off and crouched by the door. I watched, and no one came or went into the attic. Around 11 p.m., I once more heard the little song coming from the attic. A bit scared, but really curious as to what was going on, I decided that I would go up into the attic and find out what was going on. I was a little afraid, but my curiosity overrode the fear, and I crept out of my room and slowly over to the attic door. I opened it up and turned on the attic light. I went up the stairs and kept expecting someone to jump out and grab me at any moment. Once I was up the stairs, I was able to tell where the music was coming from. It was coming from the desk with the vanity mirror. Going slowly over to it, I noticed that one of the drawers was slightly open. I quietly pulled it open and took a look inside. There was a little music box that was sitting in the drawer, playing the tune. I picked it up and looked at it. It was simply a box with a lid on it. It was still playing when I was holding it. Lifting the lid, I could see that it had a glass top on it that showed you the inner workings of the box. When I turned it upside down, I felt my heart begin pounding. There was a winding lever on the bottom of the box. There was no way that that box could play on its own unless someone had wound the box. And that meant someone had to be in the attic to wind it. And I hadn't seen anyone enter or leave since I began watching. Keeping the box, I ran down the stairs and woke up my dad. I explained to him what had happened. He came to the conclusion that I did. Grabbing a bat, he went to explore the attic. What he found has given me chills to this very day. In the attic, off on the far end, there was a small door that led to a cubbyhole. When he opened the cubbyhole, there was a small and old woman cowering in it. She had empty cans of food and water and smelled foul as hell. He shut her back into the hole and held it closed while my mom called the police. The woman was the sister of the older lady we bought the house from. She also happened to be quite mentally ill and couldn't bring herself to leave the house when her sister moved. So she chose to remain in the house, in the cubbyhole, coming out when we were all asleep. I guess the music box soothes her. I have no idea why she left it in the drawer, rather than taking it into the cubbyhole. Who knows how long she might have been up there, if I hadn't ever heard that music box. It was weird. Number 3. Paranoia 
Paranoia is a very weird thing. It can cause you a lot of problems. But paranoia is not necessarily only a bad thing. It can occasionally really help you out. I came into a good sum of money about five years ago. Inheritance money. I don't really want to talk about it more than that though, because it brings up some very bad memories. But I went from not having much money to having quite a bit. I remember growing up and watching that show, Press Your Luck. It's the one where you win big prizes and money by spinning on a big board and doing your best to avoid a whammy because it will take away all of your money. Well, there was a guy on the show once named Michael Larson who won over $100,000 on the show. He, for some reason, kept the money all in cash and lost $50,000 of it when people from the neighborhood broke into his house because they knew he had money. Well, a lot of people in my neighborhood were aware of my inheritance. And although I wasn't stupid enough to keep my money in cash, I was very scared that people might break into my house to steal from me anyway. I decided to go ahead and set up a security system in my home. I had really small cameras put up in all my rooms. The cameras remained up for a really long time, but it seemed for the longest time that putting them up was nothing more than paranoia. I did eventually have someone break into my house though. It was odd. It was odd that although the basement sliding glass door was busted, and it was obvious that someone had broken in, it wasn't obvious why they broke in. Nothing was damaged, other than the door. Nothing was stolen. It was just really strange. And then, I reviewed the security tape, and it got even weirder. On the tape, a person fiddled with the door, and rather than breaking it open, he was eventually able to open it, and when he walked in, he closed the door behind him. Then, he simply walked over to the security camera and stood there, looking at it. His head was cocked to the left, and then to the right, all the while just looking directly into the lens of the security camera. A very small smile eventually crossed his face, but he just stood there and watched the camera. After nearly an hour of doing this, he mouthed the words, I'll come very, very soon. He then winked at me, thrust his hands in his pockets, and walked over to the door. He opened the door and then closed it. Once he was outside, he smashed the glass door, which he apparently did for no reason, unless it was his way of trying to let me know that he had gotten in the house, and the videotape from the camera was the only way he could let me know that he could get in without making a noise, and he could do it at any time. The police didn't know who he was and they couldn't find him. He never came back, but in a way, I wish that he had. I mean, I was paranoid before, but after watching that very weird video, my paranoia gained a face, and the longer time passed, the more I expected it to eventually happen. Maybe he was someone who just wanted to make me paranoid. Or maybe he is out there, and plans on coming back one day. Who knows? I don't. But I wish I did. Hey all, Killer Orange Cat here. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Killer Orange Cat, please make sure to hit the button next to the tabby to be informed of new content. Please visit my Facebook page, like it, 
and feel free to follow Ichigo and myself on Twitter as well. I want to apologize because I'm sure it's obvious my voice is a little hoarse right now. It's been like this for a couple of days and that's why I've been delaying making a new video. But Friday has always been my favorite day to be scared, so I figured that despite the hoarse sound of my voice, I would go ahead and make a video. I hope it was not too distracting. Now, you've probably noticed that the cat in this picture is not Ichigo. One of my closest friends, Kevin, is a great lover of felines. He has rescued quite a few of them in his day. This cat, Sunny, was the one I probably knew the best. Sonny was a big boy, very loving and cuddly. Unfortunately, at the age of 15, Sonny passed away on April 20th. This picture is my tribute to him. I waited to post a picture of him because I wanted it to be a Killer Orange Cat only video that Sonny was mentioned in. Rest in peace, Sonny. You were an amazing cat. And please remember to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.